1981, I believe. Okay, Boker Tov, everybody. Thank you. Okay, we were uh, in the middle of Perak of Mish, of Perak Aleph Mishnah Vav, the second pair of the Zukot. Remember, Pirkei Avod is really uh, the going through the history of our, our tradition from generation to generation, Moshe getting the Torah to Sinai, and then there's sort of this um, period that we really know very little about, and the period really before Torah Shabal Pet takes off, sort of the, the pre mishnaic you know, period, and that's the period, the five generation of Zugot. One is the Nasi, the quote-unquote president, and one is the Abbatin, the, uh, the chief justice of the the Sanhedrin, and their five generations, we discussed the first week, ending with Hillel and Shammai, who are um, our generation number five. But uh, when now we're in, the, in generation number two, um, Yoshua ben Prachi and Nita Har Arbeli. So we'll discuss, uh, we're up to Mishnah Zayin, Nita Har Arbeli, Omer. So uh, like many of these people, Antiglish um, Isocho, Yossi ben Yochanan, Ish Yerushalayim, Yossi ben Yochanan, uh, Ish... Yossi ben Yehuzer Isreda. Uh, many people got their names from the places they lived, which is a very common thing. The the Vilna Gaon. Um, so many things in Judaism are named by the place, and I think perhaps there's an idea here that the uh, the sage gives great honor to the place. What makes like Vilna a, a great city is 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 the Vilna Gaon lived there, and uh, you know so it's very common. So we refer to people by by where they live. That was a uh, so you have here in the Mishnah, Nita Harbeli. When I was in Yeshiva Nisri, we went to Har Arbel. I assume it's up up north, uh, around there, but that's where he lived. So it says like this, Harchek Mishachein Ra, um, stay away far, Harchek, run away from a, 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 a bad neighbor. Al Tid Chaber Rasha, do not become a Chibur, do not um, make like one, or a, um, a Chaber, be a friend to an evil person. Al Tid Yayesh Min Hapurnud, and do not give up hope from... From punishment. Okay, so let's uh, let's discuss this one by one. Harchek mishachein ra, run away or, or stay far away from um, a bad neighbor. So the word harchek is very interesting. We know there's only one uh, place in the Torah that the Torah tells us to run away from something, which is if you want to if you want to chat it in or uh, say there's one. Um, the word harchek means to stay far away. It, it seems to have a much stronger connotation than, than lo. In other words, uh, lo tigno, we shouldn't steal. Uh, lo tochlu al adam, you know, we shouldn't eat this, we shouldn't do that. The word harchek means to stay very far away from. Midvar I'm sorry? Midvar sheker tirchok. Okay, correct. Midvar shek, sheker tirchak. The only time in the Torah it tells us to stay away far from something is by lying. It's a very fascinating idea. Um, the Gemara tells us, we just learned it in Dafyomi about a, a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, um, that the Chotamo Shel HaKadosh Baruch Emet, the signature of God is truth. If you want to define, we say it every day in the Shema, Shem Elokechem Emet. Um, so truth, that's like, uh, you know, the be all and end all, so to, so to speak. So the Gemara says, not only shouldn't we lie, of course we shouldn't lie, we should stay very far away from a lie which probably means the way people speak in diplomacy, double talk, you know, where you say something where you're not really lying, but you're not exactly expressing what the truth is. That's, I'm assuming that's one of the things the Torah is referring to, to stay away from a lie. It doesn't have to be um, a a direct lie, um, but even something that's, uh, you know, resembles, isn't fully the the truth, we have to stay away far from. Of course, what's interesting, and we'll see uh, maybe later on this morning, uh, we also know it at the same time, and that's... uh, that um, one can tell a white lie for um, to promote peace. There are times one is allowed to lie. So it's a sort of funny duality that on the one hand, um, lying, truth is God. Truth is the, the mita of God, the thing we have to stay far away from. But at the same time, peace, in a certain sense, we have to lie to bring peace. So that's the first thing, harchek mishachem ra. Uh, stay away far from a, um, a neighbor. Now, then he says, al tidchaber l'rasha. Do not become um, titchaber. So what does titchaber mean? So we know in modern Hebrew, um, so, uh, a chibur means like a, a composition. A mishpat is a sentence. You join a few sentences together, you uh, become a, a chibur. Lechaber is to tie up. A chaber is a friend. So a friend means you and him are, are close. So the, the question is, there's, they're basically saying the, the same thing. Harchek mishachein ra. Uh, stay away, run away from a, a bad neighbor. 
and um, do not become like close to an evil person. It's redundant. What, what is uh, really, what's, what, what's he saying? You should, if, you're, if I run away from a bad neighbor, I'm not going to become very close. I'm not going to become like one with a, a Russia. So what does he mean? So um, the Tosvat Yontif says very, very simply, um, uh, your neighbor, you live next to him. You know, you go pick up the paper in the morning, you go for a walk and you see your, your neighbor. So you have to sometimes, if your neighbor is, is, can possibly have an, a negative influence on you, you have to run away from your neighbor. The healthy Chaber Rasha is talking about someone who isn't your neighbor. You don't have to run away from him. You're not in his business, his, um, the vicinity. So you shouldn't become too close. It's very nice. It's true, but it really doesn't add anything. That's kind of obvious that, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's like that. So, um, the, the Bartonur says there are really two issues. One issue, of course, is we're afraid, um, of being, there's, following in the ways of somebody who's evil, and then there's being influenced by somebody who's evil. In other words, um, we have to run away from somebody um, who's bad. But at the same time, um, even if you, um, you know, if you, if you come, even if you're not influenced by the person, or you don't become like him, being in the presence of people who are negative are gonna have a negative influence. The bartender says like walking into a, a perfume store. Even if you don't buy anything, and those are the examples they would give. Even if you don't buy anything, the smell of the store rubs off on you. So that's, of course, a pleasant smell. But they have unpleasant smells that um, rub, rub off on you. He points out the oil of Russia, oil of Even if you're not influenced, we have a, a, a idea that uh, bad for the wicked, bad for his neighbor. Uh, what that means is actually not uh, what that could mean, A, being influenced, but also means, and this is like... Um, you know, we have an idea in um, in rabbinic literature that um, when something bad happens, the righteous are not spared. Uh, you see this being talked about now, the days. Um, you know, when the uh, the Satan gets an opportunity to do evil, evil goes all over. So you want to stay away from the Russia. That's how some of them explain. But what I think is the uh, explanation I like the best is given by the the Tiferet Yisrael, Tiferet Yisrael, I think I mentioned him a few weeks ago, Tiferet Yisrael lived in the, in the 19th century. Um, it was probably the third most important commentary after the Bartonura and the Tosvet Yontiv. Um, he has also, every once in a while, he throws in these fascinating comments, just like out of the blue. I don't know if I, I mentioned that, that he's the one in Pirkei Avot when he talks on, um, on uh, being created in the image of, of God, how blessed we are. So he starts talking about the righteous of the Gentiles. So he mentions, the first person he mentions as a righteous, righteous Gentile is Jenner, uh, the inventor of the smallpox vaccine. And uh, I think we all recognize how important um, a, a vaccine is. Last year at our, our medical ethics conference, that we ran, Eddie Reichman mentioned that uh, he asked people to, Estimate how many people died of smallpox. Does anybody have any idea how many people died in the 18th century of, of smallpox? It's actually um, a staggering number. It's a frightening number. I guess nobody, why would anybody know? Okay, unless you're in the medical field, uh, and even then. So he said 300 million people. 300 million people died of smallpox. So when the Tiferet Yisrael says, that, uh, that Jenner was one of the Hasidim at Olam, he saved hundreds of millions of lives. What's very fascinating is he doesn't talk about his character, right? For all, listen, we know there can be great scientists who are not, I, I have no idea what is that. I'm not, God forbid, accusing of anything. I'm just saying he defined his righteousness not by his character, but by his action. The fact that he saved many people doesn't in a certain sense it really didn't matter he was a great uh great person and uh, that's the first one he mentioned then he mentions he mentions gutenberg because of the invention of the printing press what um tremendous uh um impact he had on the world and a positive impact and even from a, a jewish point of view the spreading of, of torah what of course is is fascinating uh if you know the little bit of the history of the printing press and uh the the the, the jewish people when the printing press was invented uh there were a group of rabbis who were adamantly opposed to it it's very funny today 500 years later it's just like it's a little funny 20 years later the opposition of many rabbis 
to the internet. In other words, new technologies were always very frightening to the, um, the, the rabbis. The printing press had two great fears of the printing press, which is the internet just multiplies it a hundred times. Who needs a rabbi anymore? I, I don't need a rabbi. I, I read, I, I can look it up in a book. I, I don't need interaction. So that was one fear. But the second fear was that uh, I think that from what I understand, the leading person against the printing press was the Maharala Prague's brother. Uh, Maharala Prague had, had a great brother, not quite as famous, Rabbi Bitsalel, I believe. Um, and he was very, wrote very much negative against the printing press. And he was afraid that it would hurt Ashkenazic you know, practice. What people would read, oh, the Sephardim eat kidney on Pesach, whatever. In other words, you would lose local minha because now it's universalized, democratized laws. I just find that as a fascinating uh, idea. But the Tiberi Yisrael mentions that uh, Gutenberg was one of the, the Hasidium at Olam because of inventing the printing press, the vaccine. But Anyway, that's uh, he's a he's a fascinating commentary. He discussed international things, but every once in a while in the mission, he just goes up on on a tangent and discusses some fascinating idea. So he says like this: He says, "Alt harchek mishachin ra to run away from someone who is um, a, a bad neighbor." That's talking about a person whose character is bad. Uh, the examples he gives is um, having a temper, being arrogant. And, and jealousy. Those are the three character traits he mentioned, and, and similar things, he says. But someone gets angry, arrogant, then it's, it's just you have to run away from such a person because the character will have a very negative influence. But al the Rasha, not to become best friends with an evil person. You don't have to run away from him. You can be friendly, just not his best friend. That's talking about a non-religious person. Whether he's saying this because living in the middle of the 1800s, and this is the beginning of the, uh, you know, where many Jews are becoming, you know, irreligious, the idea of an irreligious Jew. And I say irreligious here, I refer to, of course, the rituals of, of Judaism, Shabbat, Kashrut, etc. So until the beginning of the 1800s, you couldn't be a member of the Jewish community and not keep Shabbat in public. It just wasn't possible. You didn't keep Shabbat in, in public, they, you had to leave. The community, of course, if we know God, if you intermarried, that was it. Everybody knew there, there were there was no such thing as being a you know a, a non a non fully observant Jew at least in in public. As far as I know, there are only two communities in the world left like that. Uh, we were in Gibraltar, you know, on our, one of our tour motion trips, and Gibraltar is uh, there are about eight hundred Jews at the tip of Spain. It's officially England. Um, and um, there are 800 Jews, it's an amazing community, four shuls that are packed, Eight, 800 Jews, and there are four shuls that are full, um, because there's not, there's zero Chilol Shabbos, there's no Chilol Shabbos, there's no desecration of Shabbat in, in public, the community is being 100% observant, and I understand in, um, in, in Jerba, I haven't been there, that's the other place, but we have no other communities in the world like this, but that's the way Jewish life used to be. That started to change, of course, with the Enlightenment, emancipation, and so you start having tons of religious Jews. Well, talk about it. What, what should be the relationship? How close can you be to irreligious e e Jews? Um, so um, perhaps, I don't know, this is my theory, I have no idea, that the virtual is sort of influenced by this is what's going on in the world, but he says you have to run away from bad character traits, but you don't have to run away from your non-religious neighbor. And he goes a step further. He says, no, you shouldn't run away from him because you should be friendly with him and maybe you'll influence him, invite him for um, a Shabbat meal. And really what the Tiberi Yisrael is saying, a point that he did not invent this point. This is sort of rooted in our tradition, but I think it's, it's people often don't pay attention, I don't think, uh, enough to it, is the difference between the division between, you know, sort of character traits and uh, religiosity. Of course, character traits is part of our, our religion. It's the basis of our, our, our religion, you know, but, but um, you know, so the, the idea is that basically what the Deberge Israel is saying is there's no fear that, and it's true, I think it's very true. I, an observant Jew is not gonna be influenced because people around him don't keep kosher. I don't think that's a, um, a strong, people who keep kosher are not tempted to eat not kosher because all their friends are eating not kosher. It's just, that's not uh, what happens. But if all their friends are not so honest in the business world, if their business partners are doing this shady deal and that, 
that will have a great influence on you. We're, we're, we are greatly influenced by, we see this one acting like this, this one acting like that. So it is the character that um, we have to worry about, character impacting us much more. We don't have to worry so much that someone who's not really, I think that's very true. Now what the Tiberius Israel is saying, run away from people who have bad character traits, are not honest, are arrogant, uh, have a, a temper, are jealous, but uh, you can, you sh they shouldn't be your best friends. You don't want to have your you don't want to have your best friends as people who aren't observant. But absolutely, there's no reason to harchek me them. You don't have to run away. You just shouldn't be al You shouldn't be like one. That's what a chibur. You shouldn't be like one with those people. But you should be friendly with them. This idea, I'll just give two other examples, is very um, rooted, you know, in our 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 tradition. The importance of character over what we would call religious um, issues. So that's. Uh, I don't know if the, the, a famous comment, I think, of, of, of the Ran has it. The, it was a medieval commentary on the Talmud. I believe Rav Shimshim Fal Hirsch, if I'm not mistaken, 19th century, also 19th century, says a similar idea. You know, um, they asked a question on Avram Avinu, that uh, Avram Avinu sent his servant uh, halfway around the world to find a wife for his son. Like, and why? What, what 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 did he get? Like uh, what you know? He 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 got a wonderful girl, but uh, okay, okay, Rivka, whatever. But um, but what was 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 it so much worse to get? Why do you have to go around the world to find somebody? So the Ron explains. I don't know how he knows this exactly, or I guess this is the feeling of Abraham. Is that um, in other words, Laban and Betuel, they were idol worshippers. But he, he didn't find such a great family. The, that's our assumption. They, uh, they were not observant. Rivka was an exception. We know what Laban was like. So, uh, so um, they were, as the way the run describes it, the, um, they were not religious. They were idol worshippers, but they were fine people. They were hospitable people. And Abraham Avinu felt the people where he was living amongst the 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 Knanim were deficient in their character. And Abraham said, "I'm happy to have uh, a child of idol worshippers. I'm happy to have someone who grew up worshiping idols. Is that you can always talk? You have a um, a philosophy class. You can debate. Um, re, re, you can debate religious issues. This not, but." What is the essence of the person is the character of the person. Their, their belief system is sort of external. That's, that doesn't, you can have, a, you can be an idol worshiper and uh, we're, you know, have beliefs that we don't accept, but be um, a wonderful person. So Avram Avinu was willing or in, insisted on having someone who felt came from a family of good character. The problem, of course, is Levan didn't have such great character, but let's leave that aside. And um, but he was willing to deal with idolatry. He wasn't willing to deal with character. Perhaps where you see it stronger is an idea that Rashi points out. And Rav Chaim, I heard in the name of Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, who, who died in 1918, Rav Soloveitchik's grandfather, that um, the Torah tells us na ase adam bitzalmenu. Um, let us make man. I'm sure most people here are familiar with the difficulty in the verse. What do you mean, let us make man? God consulted with the, the board of, of, of directors. Who, who's God talking to? Nasa, let us make man. And Rashi famously points out that uh, God wanted to teach us to be humble. Uh, remember, we're created in the image of, of God. So everything the Torah tells us about God it's really talking about us. Because as the Rambam, especially if you take the view of the Rambam, that there, we can't understand God at all, only in a negative sense, we can't understand what God is, who God is. So everything about God, we are like God. We are B'Tselem Elohim. That's a heretical idea almost, you know, that we're like God. That's what it says in, in the Torah. That's why chapter one is in the Bible, not to tell us how the creation story happened. That you go to, to a science book. But the Torah is not telling us how creation happened. It's why creation happened. What's the purpose of the creation? So man is the created in the image of God. So everything we know about God, you know about man. The Yud Gimel Midot, Mahu Rachum, the same way God is merciful, we should be merciful. Rav Soloveitchik says sort of the first message of the Torah is to be creative. The same way God is a creator, Rashid for Elohim, man has to be a creator. And every person has to use their creative talents, whatever field, art, music, science, uh, Torah learning. You know, everybody has a, a area where they can be creative and expert, and that's what you have to do. And of course, that's why the first meets on the Torah is to create new people. So whatever. So Rashi points this out directly. Nasadam, God. Uh, that, that, that's 
That's heresy. What do I mean, God, will, we will make man? But it's to teach man a lesson that even God consults. You should never make an important decision on your own. You never can see everything. We'll get that in a moment in the next Mishnah. You should always consult with other people. So God wanted to teach us that lesson. So even God consulted, quote unquote, with the angels. But Russia, but that's heresy. What do I mean, God, to say that other people created? So as Rav Chaim says, that's okay. God, it was more important for God to teach this lesson of character, of humility, to consult with others. And so maybe some people will become heretics. But probably not, but he was less concerned with being sort of um, um, intellectually pure, philosophically pure about God, and much more concerned about man. So this is the idea of, you know, we character, that's we have to be worried about, who our friends are. Religiosity, that's much less, especially in the modern world, of course, where most Jews, you know, uh, religiosity doesn't, you can be a wonderful person. I'm, I don't know, unfortunately, I don't know what word to use, but... Um, one would hope that someone who was quote unquote religious would be a greater character, but I think we all know that's not necessarily true. Uh, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Every ritual has an ethical teaching. We eat matzah to develop sensitivity to the poor. We fast on Yom Kippur to know what it's like to be hungry, to help people. That's what the Gemara says. The reward for a fast is the charity we give. So even our rituals are meant to develop our character, but there it's hard. So we don't think about it. We go through the motions. Prayer. We go. We we don't think about what's the character development in that. So I think this is a very important idea, which I guess is why I spent the last ten minutes talking about it. Um, that and that's how the Tiferet that ex, um, explains the difference between the two ideas in the Mishnah. Run away from someone of evil character, but um, the people who's not religious, they they you know your neighbor as he's pulling the car out on Shabbos, say hello, how are you? A uh, nice day, but you know he's not your best friend because you're. We do want to be influenced. People who are studying Torah will you know get us to do positive things, but we can influence them. Um, the Rambam takes this to the greatest extreme. It's like you know every, every once in a while you read a halacha and you wonder like uh, I don't know we'll see. Uh, Joking, I mean, uh, I, I don't. I mean, I say that. I say that actually. Like you, you read these things. Think, oh, this is like insane. Um, the Rambam writes, you know, you have to live in a in a in a good neighborhood. Everybody wants to live in a good neighborhood. Good schools, good, you know, upper middle class, whatever. Everybody wants to live in a in a in a, in a nice neighborhood. So the Rambam says to him, a nice neighborhood is where people are charitable, hospitable, you know. But if you're living in a neighborhood like uh, like. In Stom, in the Torah, look, you, have, you can't, we criticize, look, because he moved to Stom. He wanted to make money, so he moved to Stom. So, um, um, so um, you know, the Rambam says, if you have to move away, if you have a bad neighborhood, everybody moves away. But bad neighborhood doesn't just mean uh, economics or who knows what, or new housing development you don't like. It means character, the character neighborhood. And the Rambam says, what if you can't find a good neighbor? There are no good neighborhoods in the city. Everybody's corrupt, and, you know, you live in a society... So the Rambam says, anybody know where the Rambam says you have, you have to live? The Rambam says you have to move to a desert. So I don't know, like, uh, I don't know, like, this is like, you know, I don't know anybody who's, who's going to, but you know what, but that's the ghetto. The, 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 the Hasidic groups or certain groups who ghettoize themselves is probably based on, on this Rambam. They feel all these outside influences. No, no, I don't think the Rambam would agree. The Rambam, then a great philosopher, Oakland, whatever. But the, the Rambam does write that. What I find fascinating, and you put, I always like to, you know, those who've heard me enough times know I like to do this. You know, you look at a Rambam here, then you look at a Rambam somewhere else. And even though they have nothing to do with each other, but the same person is saying this something, it's quite fascinating. The Rambam has another halacha. The Rambam, um, you know, one of the, uh, there has been, uh, you know, 80,000, you know, pages of a paper written why the Rambam doesn't count living in Israel as one of the 613 mitzvot. We're in the, between Yom Atzmud and Yom Yerushalayim, you know, the time we, we think about Israel. Baruch Hashem, Israel is doing a lot better than pr pretty much anywhere else in the world. Um, so, um, the, you know, the, uh, the mitzvah to live in Israel. So the Rambam, when he counts his 613 mitzvah, he doesn't count living in Israel as a mitzvah. That's a whole other subject. Like I say, 80, uh, thousands and thousands of, uh, everybody talks about it. The, the Ramban, Nachmanides, was the first one to heavily criticize the Rambam. How, how could he leave out living in Israel? So that's a technical question. How do you count mitzvot? The Rambam, uh, believe me, you'll see in a second, it's not that the Rambam didn't feel it's important to, to live in Israel. For, for technical reasons, he didn't count it as one of the 613 mitzvot, or maybe other reasons. But the Rambam actually writes 
that it's better. It's not the Rambam. It's based on a Gemara, but the Rambam actually, he codifies this. There are many things in Gemara that are, are, are not codified in Jewish law. The Rambam left out. He didn't feel they're binding in Jewish law. So the Rambam do, does codify the Talmudic statement that it's better to live um, in the land of Israel in a city of idolaters than to live outside of Israel in a city of righteous people. So that's astounding because you put that together with the Rambam that you have to move to a desert to get away from people who are a negative influence. It would appear, I don't know anybody who pointed this out, but the, it appears to me simply that only applies outside of Israel. But the influence of Israel is, is so great. Either you'll be influenced by being in Israel, the, the, the place where God's, you know, um, uh, where we feel God more or just whatever, uh, the people in Israel are better, whatever the situation is. The Rambam says it's okay to live in a city, it's it, it's better to live in Israel, even in a bad neighborhood, meaning in a neighborhood where bad idolaters are are, are living, and uh, than to live in a bustling Torah center outside of Israel. So that's um, a little bit uh, this idea. I'll mention one other very important point I gave uh, a couple years ago, a whole hour share on this. Um, Rav Meir and Acher. We know there's, uh, I'm sure, um, in other words, how close can we learn Torah from non-religious people, from non-observant um, people? And again, like I spoke last week on Machloket, like many of these, and I mentioned last week, and these meta issues, you know, not technical issues, generally in the Talmud we'll find two schools of thought, often two diametrically schools of thought, and uh, we live with the tension because both are true. Uh, some, some will, some commentaries will focus on A, some will focus on B, some will try to reconcile, some will say it applies here, doesn't apply there, and here you have the same idea. On the one hand, we have uh, the verse often quoted, and you'll hear this quoted by people, Kisite Kohen Yishmeru Dat, the lips of the Kohen uh, keep our dot, our um, knowledge and religion, um, the Torah Hashem Yivakshumi Pihu. Um, then the Torah of God we shall seek from his mouth. The Kohanim, their main role was not to work in the temple. The Kohanim's main role was to be teachers of Torah and more. This, this week's Parsha is about the Kohanim. We get the feeling, read the Torah, Kohanim in the temple. Most Kohanim in the temple, they work two days a year. They have 24-week shifts and then only one day a week. And the rest of the time, they are the teachers of, of Torah and the Pasuk um, Malachi says that Kisip they call Yishru Dat, they're the ones you should seek Torah from them. Ki, ki Malach Hashem I don't know if I'm quoting it exactly right. They're the angels of God. And the Gemara has a famous thing. If they're Malachi Hashem, if the Kohanim are like angels of God, then we are Mivakesh Torah Mipiu. Then we have to seek Torah from their mouths. But if these uh, people, these are not the righteous, then we can't learn Torah from them. We can only learn Torah. How can you learn Torah from someone who doesn't accept the precepts of, of, of Torah? And that's, uh, I, I don't have to tell you, there are many segments in the world today that believe in that, in the, are in the Jewish world. We can only learn Torah from, uh, quote unquote, uh, listen, there was uh, a tshuva read, written, I don't even want to mention that, it's us to learn Torah from anybody who attended Yeshiva University, one of the great Pusky in, in Bor Park. A number of years ago, there was an article in tradition about it. Kathleen Torah went to Yeshiva University. Obviously, he's not an observant Jew, and he was even he was an observant Jew. But his the hashkap of Yeshiva University, secular studies, it, that uh, it it influences him. I mean, in a certain sense, uh, I totally understand it. We are influenced by our, our surroundings. That's what the Mishnah is saying. And if you live in a surrounding where science is important, the secular side is important, that's going to influence your halakha. Absolutely it will. And they don't want that influence. So it's the same thing. What I always say, we spoke about it last week, a selah harab. You have to make a rabbi who has a similar worldview to you because the worldview impacts on your halakhic decision-making. But whatever. So that's one idea, that uh, people who aren't observant, you can't learn Torah. On the other hand, we have... And the Rambam is, of course, the one who says this. Kabela met me mishamro. We accept truth from wherever it's said. Ezu hachacham halomet mikol adam. You learn from everybody. Everybody has what to say. And of course, the famous story: Rav Meir and Acher. Uh, Rav Meir um, was very close and remained close to Acher Elisha Ben Avua, even after he became a heretic. And the famous story: they're walking on Shabbos. Elisha Ben Avua is on his horse, which of course is not allowed, and they're walking together on Shabbos, talking. And uh, they reach the point of the Tchum Shabbos, where the list, you know, you can't walk more than a 
approximately a kilometer outside of, of the city limits, you live in a big city, you don't have that problem. If you're in the cottage, you have to worry about that. Where's the edge of the of the town? You can't walk too far uh, aside. So Alicia Benavia said to Rav Mayer, ah, we can't go any further. And the Rav Mayer went back and Alicia Benavia continued going horseback riding, whatever. And they said, Rav Mayer, how, how can you be such friends with the, he's a heretic. He's the Avi Avot, he's the chief heretic. And he said, so he takes the, he throws out the pit and he eats the fruit. So you have these basically two, and our, our tradition has these two values. Um, do we, um, should we learn Torah from everybody and anybody has what to say? Or do we say, no, Torah is so pure, we can only learn from friends. As you see, there's, now, obviously there are many approaches how to quote unquote reconcile this. Maybe it depends if you're learning one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe if you're reading his book, it doesn't matter, you're not influenced. There are all kinds of responses, but, um, but um, there's a phenomenal article written by, now I forget his name, he uh, is the, it used to be the head of um, Orot, Orot College in Israel. Um, and he wrote a, a 30 page article, fantastic article. It's in Hebrew only, as, as far as you know, discussing when we can learn in quotes about 10 different views of the Rishonim, the Achronim, how to reconcile, we can't reconcile. So, you know, a, a, a dispute. but again, I just want to point out these two things. So our relationship to, to non-religious is uh, one thing. Relationship to bad character, that there's not so much of a debate about. People who are bad character are going to have a negative influence. But when it comes to non-religiosity, that's a totally different realm of, of thought. And even teaching Torah, uh, many of us, they have what insights into Torah. It also turns how do you define Torah? Maybe, maybe Torah is not technical knowledge. Maybe anybody who knows, you have a, a, a non-Jew who knows Gemara really well. It's not, Torah might be a, a way of life, may not be referring to knowledge. So there's all kinds of ways to understand that. I don't have to tell you, I, I come from the world, I guess, that, you know, in, the, in today's world, obviously we have to have a much more open view towards, uh, you know, forget whether it's Enoch Shanish, but not even going there, just a whole different view of, um, as Rav Lichtenstein often pointed out, uh, again, the tension on the one hand um, to realize there are true seekers of God. There are, there are true seekers of God in non-Orthodox movement, non-religious Jews. Some of them are wonderful people of great ethical sensitivity and we can learn from them and we should be part, uh, they're part of our community even if they eat on Yom Kippur. On the other hand, uh, we have our certain standards we have to maintain. It's always finding the balance between these two aspects. Okay. Um, all right. Let me uh, go on. Enough about that. Uh, in case uh, if you if you get bored, if you think I'm talking too long on a subject, somebody just hit the gong bell, and I can go on whatever. Okay. Somebody just sent me a question before I I go on. Um, Okay, should a community rabbi live in a place and get close to people who need their mitzvah approved? Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll say this. In other words, um, we said, of course. I listen. It's not nothing's all or nothing. No one is perfect character. We all need character development. So when they say, but the run, but the the very just saying, a person who's full of arrogance, jealousy, temper. We we know we can distinguish. Now the rabbi's role is to improve, uh, is to help the character. Obviously, a rabbi has to go live in these places. Sometimes it is dangerous. The OU, a couple, a uh, couple like like Jewish weeks. Uh, maybe you know I lose track of 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 time. But but in Jewish action. I think a couple of years ago, they ran a story of people who grew up in small towns, um, like really small towns where there may not have even been a minion on Shabbos or barely a minion on Shabbos, only a minion on Shabbos, you know, like, uh, you know, their father was a professor, you know, in some, uh, you know, in Idaho somewhere and they're, you know, 11 and a half Jews there. And actually most of them, these kids generally turned out more observant than people, you know, growing up in the bigger cities. They're somehow, often when you're in a small city, you feel much greater responsibility. Often you, often you can do much more when you're in a place where there are not other observant Jews. It often depends on the character of the person, you know, who, who you are. But obviously, um, uh, that's the rabbi's job. The rabbi's job is to go and to improve people. It's kind of more as lahav, uh, not, not, not lahavdil. It's the same thing, um, a doctor. Um, doctors have to take on greater risk. The rules of pikuach nefesh for a doctor are not the same as for other people. What's going on now? There are limits even to doctors, but that's what it means. A, a, um, a soldier can't say, that's the famous comment of the Minchat Chinuch, a soldier can't say, I don't want to go fight because that's pikuach nefesh. Of course it's pikuach nefesh, but that's what it means to be um, a soldier. So to be um, a doctor means you're going to take on greater risk. To mean a firefighter, 
means you're going to put yourself in a situation, a policeman, all these jobs, but we need them. And yes, you're right. For a normal person, it might not be allowed, the average person, the non-policeman. But they, so it's the same thing. The rabbi has to put himself at greater spiritual risk. If you say that, I think that often will strengthen a rabbi. Sometimes it's not even um, a risk or strengthen um, a, um, a person. But yes, and there is no doubt, as I think I mentioned this uh, once, I've mentioned other places that a rabbi once told me, uh, the day he became a rabbi is the day he stopped up me. Because uh, he's in shul, you can't up and it's a rabbi in the shul. He's a, he has in the shul where there are eight minyanim on Shabbos, so, you know, he speaks at three of them, and he goes from here to there, and he's getting people to be quiet and worried here. They, you, you, and they're dumbing very fast. People, you know, especially on, on the weekday, people, you know, 24 minute minion, you know, so I said, no, I used to dub and like, uh, I'm supposed to dub and I'm a shul rabbi. I can't dub anymore. You know, that although I'm, uh, if you want to learn, don't become a rabbi. I mean, uh, it's, uh, uh, the rabbi's job is not to learn Torah. I, of course, that's part of his job. That's the Rosh Hashiva's job. The rabbi's job is, as Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik famously said, to take care of the orphan, the widow, and the poor. That's the number one job of, of the rabbi. So, yes, the rabbi is going to have to move to places and do things that might be, quote-unquote, risky for other people. But we're assuming and hoping the person who becomes a rabbi is stronger in strength. I mentioned last night, I was giving a, a class that's not necessarily true. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter has a, a cute comment. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the founder of the Musser movement, again in the 19th century, where Jews were a little bit unethical or not as ethical as they should have been and trying to focus on character. So uh, there's, I own to a part of his story, he said uh, a businessman once came to him and he said, I am not, I'm, I'm sorry, um, um, a shochet once came to him and said, I don't want to be a shochet anymore. He said, why not? He said, you know, I, I slaughter a cow, 500 people eat from one cow, and maybe I made a mistake, and maybe the meat is, isn't kosher, and my shkita, you know, the knife wasn't 100% clear, and uh, 500 people are eating non-kosher food because of me. I cannot take that responsibility on my head. I don't want to be a shochet anymore. So Rabbi Yisrael Salanter said, well, what do you want to do with your life? So he said, I'll, I'll go into business. So Rabbi Joseph said, are you crazy? You think there are religious problems being um, a shochet. It's a hundred times worse in the business world. Everything. How do you pray? How do you treat your consumer? How do you treat competition? Hiring workers, firing workers. Are you crazy? The, the halakhic pitfalls of being a, a businessman are much, much greater than being um, a shochet. And then he said that it takes like twice as much religious strength religious character to be a honest businessman, then there's going to come a, um, a rabbi who's going to, nobody goes to the rabbi and offers them, I, I, I hope not, offers them a shady business deal. But uh, you go to your friend in business and you offer them, you know, it's, uh, it's not really illegal. It's uh, this and that. So the rabbi, he's in shul all day. He's learning. He's de dealing with wonderful things. So he doesn't have a temptation to cheat as much. In business, it's hard. It's very hard. Very hard to be honest. So you have to be much greater religious strength to be a businessman than to be um, a rabbi. So I don't know that it's true that the rabbis are, are better protected because that's what they do. I think sometimes the, the observant businessman is much better. Uh, he's, uh, he's on a much higher level of religiosity. He uh, knows how to withstand temptation, whatever, much greater than the rabbi. I don't know. Anyways, but yes, our, a rabbi has to go live out um, with people if need be. And of course, I don't have to, that's how Lubavitch is Lubavitch. They're the masters at this. They're the experts at this. Okay, let's go on to Altitia uh, Yeshmin of Kuranu, just very briefly. Don't, um, don't ever give up. Don't give up. Um, so always hope God, uh, you know, especially we're talking about evil, Russia, and how come it's good for the evil, Russia, Vitovlo, Tzadik, Gorello. Don't, uh, don't give up. If not in this world, sometimes we see people punished in, in this world. We see with our own eyes coming back, and sometimes we don't. We have to wait for the, the next world. Okay, let's do the next Mishnah. Mishnah Chet. Yehuda ben Tabai v'Shimon ben Shetach. We're the third generation of the five Zugot. Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shetach, Kiblu Mehem. They received from them. Yehuda ben Tabai Omer. Uh, basically, the next two Mishnahs talk about the court system and uh, have to, how they have to cross-examine the witnesses and you have to act properly in, in court. We'll go through it uh, properly in, in a moment, but you'll see they're talking about it. Probably they're talking about it because of uh, um, the, the story in the Talmud about Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shetach. By the way, by Shimon ben Shetach, just two points about him. And um, 
he's more known than Yehuda ben Tabe. There's a little bit more about him. Shimon Shalach lived in the time of Choni Hamagal. He was the one who got upset that Choni Hamagal, you know, when he drew the circle and he demanded God bring rain. So, uh, so and God listened. God did this. And Choni said, no, no, I don't want rain like this. I want rain like that. No, no, I want this. He argued with God and God did what he wanted. And, and Shimon ben Shetach sent him a note and he said, you know, I have to put you in cherem. I have to excommunicate it. A chutzpah, the way you talk to God. A terrible. But what can I do? You talk to God like that, and he, he listens. He, he must like you. It must be okay for you to talk to God like him. Shimon Shetach, I always went, uh, I always love to teach the story, the famous story of Shimon Shetach, talking about business ethics. Um, he's the one who bought, a, um, bought an animal, and they found, and the, his, he, was, he was quite poor, Shimon Ben Shetach. And he bought an animal, and they're cleaning the animal, and uh, whatever, somebody in the house said, hey, we struck gold. There was a expensive diamond, uh, you know, in the throat of the animal, whatever. You're a rich man. You know, obviously, finders keepers. We have no idea who it, it comes from. You can keep it. And she mentioned, this, what do you think I am, a barbarian? I didn't buy uh, uh, any, gold, any jewelry, diamonds. I bought, the, you know, an animal. And he went back to the butcher, went a well back thing until they discovered who it was. And he returned it to the, the idol worshiper. And this idol worshiper said, wow, praise is the God of Shema Ben Shetha. What a wonderful person. Can, what, we must come from an amazing re- religion. In the ancient world, everybody saw things in religious sense that he will do such a thing. That's one famous, you know, beautiful story of Shema Ben, ben Shetha. But the story that probably informs what they're talking about in the Mishnah is the following, that um, the Mishnah, uh, the Gemara says there was a, one of the big arguments between the Stukim and the Prushim. We know one of the big arguments is this week's Parsha, Mimacharat HaShabbat. Do you start counting Omer the day after Pesach or do you start counting on, um, on, the, on, on Sunday, on Mimacharat HaShabbat? That's a very, very famous argument. But there are other arguments. So the Mishnah says that had to do with Edim Zomi. Without getting into all the technical details, um, so Adim's, if anybody was a Rabbi Mintz's shear on, on Sunday, I invite you to come back, fascinating shear. So he, he Adim's Omimim came up in the shear. Adim's Omimim are a, sp- a particular type of false witnesses. Anyways, what happened is they get the punishment. They were wanted to meet out. So if they falsely wanted to have somebody put to death, they would be put to, to death. That's the law. It's still came, there was an argument. Um, Jew, we hold, the Prushim hold, that that's only before the uh, punishment is actually meted out. Um, and the Stukim hold that, no, it's only after you actually gave the death penalty. Or we hold it's if you want to give the death penalty and you're caught, then you get the death penalty instead. But if they already gave out the death penalty, it's fascinating law. We don't have time for it now. If they already gave the death penalty, the false witness wouldn't get the death penalty. And Stukim held the exact opposite. So Yehuda ben Tabai said he once killed the Nade Zomim um, be, beforehand to show that Stukim are wrong. So before the, the, the witness was, was, was killed, like oh, we say, you killed them. So I wanted to prove this wrong. He was bragging, you know, saying how wonderful he did this great religious act to show that Stukim wrong. So Shimon Shetach said, uh, he said, Ereb Nachama, you know, it should be a, a comfort for what I did. And Shimon Shetach said, Oy, 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 oy. He said, um, he said, to save the people from the heart of the Stukim because of what they said. And Shimon Shetach said, I should see comfort if you didn't, if you didn't um, kill an innocent person because Jewish law says you either you kill both witnesses or one. If one witness is false, they don't get killed. And he killed one witness. And uh, so he mistakenly put someone to death for that. So the Gemara um, then says that Yehuda ben Tabai said he's never going to, um, he's never going to rule anything um, in any matter of Jewish law unless he consults with Shimon ben Shetach first because he killed somebody accidentally. He felt terrible. And the Gemara says he spent the rest of his life, I, I don't know what it means, he went every day to the grave of the person he, um, he had put to death and he would cry on the grave, and you would hear voices. And that's a debate on the commentaries. Was that the voice of Shimon ben Shetha crying, or the voice of the person who was, who was, who was dead, whatever that means, was crying? And, um, and that voice lasted. The, the, the voice from the cemetery lasted until Shimon, until Yudah ben Tabai him, himself died. So Yudah ben Tabai, we're going to see, they're going to talk about um, how to run um, a court system, because he blew it. He, he put somebody to that. He meant well. Um, it's also interesting. Maybe this is a little bit more, more dangerous. But a little, in other words, 
when you're fighting out, words, why did he put this person to death? He wanted to prove that, that Stukim are wrong. It's very nice, but like, uh, you know, you maybe prove that Stukim are wrong not by putting people to death. I mean, he did it because that's what he thought the law was, but maybe, I don't know if I can say such a thing, but maybe sometimes when your goal is to defeat others, uh, you make a, a, a mistake. When your goal is to implement Torah, Torah which we can say that's what he wanted to do, whatever, but I just, uh, but he made a mistake. Now, it's not that Shimon ben Shetach was, uh, also made a, a terrible mistake. The mission says later on, in, in or earlier in Sanhedrin, the Gemara says that, that, that Shimon ben Shetach once killed 80 women in one day, his court. They were involved in witchcraft, and the Torah actually has a death penalty for witchcraft. You know, we know the later Mishnah, you know, once in seven years, once in seven years, but that's Rabbi Akiva, that's later. That's later than this, this is an earlier period. So I don't know, maybe the earlier period, they did, weren't, didn't have such, it uh, wasn't so hard to give uh, that penalty, but the Mishnah says, the Gemara says that Shimon ben Shetach's court killed 80 women in one day, and that was wrong, because uh, Jewish law says a court can only kill one person a, um, a day, that uh, you can never give more than one death penalty in a day, and the court has to fast on that day, and all kinds of things, so he did a thing, and then the Mishnah, the Gemara continues, the relatives of these 80 women wanted to get back at Shimon ben Shetach, so they framed his son, and they accused his son of killing a, a capital offense, and they were taking Shimon ben Shetach's son to be killed, and then the witness um, who were involved in framing him said, no, I was lying, uh, I, I recant my, my testimony, and so Shimon ben Shetach said, okay, they can't kill my son, they, they recount the testimony, and the son said, no, 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 that's not true, because Jewish law says once you say something in court, um, it cannot be recounted. That's a true. Uh, when Ein Choser Umagi, the witness, can't, re, can't recount his testimony. It's like, I remember years ago in the Olympics, somebody voted, you know, they admitted, you know, cheating with the, the Canadian figure skaters, right? Then they gave them gold medal at the end, you know, can, can, can you change it at the, uh, once you say something, and Jewish court said, no, and they put him to death, this death should be right. So Shima Menshetak also, he's going to say, you should be very careful to cross-examine the witnesses because uh, had they cross-examined the witnesses more carefully, uh, they would have picked up that he was lying, perhaps. So the, the fact that Shima Ben Shetach and uh, Yehuda Ben Tabai talk about the court system could very well be related to this idea of um, this story about uh, both of them really making a mistake in very serious matters of, of Jewish law, which in of itself is a fascinating um, message for us, you know, about... Uh, you know, great people in the court. And remember, this is also the earlier prime. As I said at the beginning, Jewish law was not fully developed yet at this point. So just let me start and then uh, just maybe do one idea and then we'll, uh, we'll call it, uh, you know, get ready for, for Shabbos. Um, okay, so I'll start with the most, the most controversial one. Yehuda ben Tavayomer, al tasat smachak orche hadayanim. Don't make yourself like orche hadayanim. So you know, in Israel, uh, a lawyer is called an orech uh, what, what's an orach din? An orach din means he, he, uh, he prepares the law. He argues the law. So you shouldn't be an orach din. So what does that mean? Uh, maybe, so the way the classic commentaries explain it, it is uh, maybe because our legal system is, is different, but uh, the Jewish legal system, it's not right to tell uh, a litigant what arguments to make so he'll win the case. That's how the Bartanur says. Uh, they tell you, this is the argument you should make. If you make this argument, you're going to win the case. They have that today, um, a towing. So that's not allowed. That's uh, in, in Jewish law, because in Jewish law, we want the truth, not what argument works better. We don't want you to tell half harcheik, mi shachein ra, right? Mitvar shecher, you know, you have to run away from a lie. So you can't tell a half truth. That's the job of lawyer. That is the job of lawyer. I mean, I hate to say it, that I'm not saying you can't be a lawyer. That's the job of lawyer in the Western world is to present arguments only that benefit their client. They're not lying. They're just not telling the whole truth. So Jewish law says we don't we don't allow such a, a system because Jewish law, the courts didn't have lawyers. Who I, who were the lawyers? The lawyers were what we call lawyers. The you know the 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 the, the criminal defendant lawyer, the um the the crown and the. The, the defense. Uh, I don't know what's. I don't know who's called in the states the crown here, right? The prosecutor is called the the crown. I guess we're under the British Commonwealth. I don't know if they call it in the United States, but anyways, the the crown prosecutor. We we don't have that. The judge and the, the judges are 
the lawyers. They do the cross-examination. And in, in, uh, in theoretically, when we had a, a Jewish court system, so to do a capital case, you had, had 23 judges. To do a civil law, you had three. Um, 23 for a capital case and 71 for national issues. The Sanhedrin, uh, between laws, uh, new laws or uh, going to war or things of that nature, you needed a Sanhedrin of 71. But your uh, your standard, you know, case of rape or murder, that went to a court of 23 people. And, um, and, um, that, and those 23 judges who were very qualified, they were the ones who cross-examined the witnesses. So they, they were asked on both sides. Our legal system is, is very different. We appoint lawyers on both sides, each one arguing for their client, and then hopefully the truth comes out between them. But we all know if you have a better lawyer, uh, your truth will somehow come out more than the other truth. So that's what the Torah seems to be trying to avoid. Don't make yourself an orachdin. Don't prepare arguments. Uh, it's what the Bartonur says. You don't like it? What can I do? Um, the, uh, he, gives a, he gives a second explanation, maybe for those who... Uh, his second explanation, and this very much fits into what we just said. Don't, an orachdin, don't take on a case you're not qualified to, to judge. Don't be, I'm going to want the orachdin, meaning to want to settle the dispute, to want to organize what the law is. And that's true. Rabbis, in all question for sure, in the court, you have to know your place. Uh, he's talking to the students. You know, they think they know more. And of course, this can be talking to himself, that he issued a ruling that um, mistakenly condemned somebody to death. And it was over his pay grade, and he the, the rest of his life he, he felt terrible um, um, about it. So that's the first thing. Alta says, "Macha korke had You have to know your place. You have to know where you are holding. And uh, also, we uh, we want to get the whole truth. The idea is not to win. That's not the job of the lawyers. The, not, the idea is not to win. The idea is to get to be what is the truth. And then very quickly, when the the litigants are standing before you, they're evil. You have to view them as evil people. They're lying. Otherwise, you're not going to cross-examine. You, know, you don't give somebody the benefit of the doubt. That we spoke last week. That's outside the court. Give someone the benefit of the doubt. You're nice to people. Court's not the place to be nice. The court's the place you talk Lashon Hara. You accuse people. You, you don't trust one thing. You say, yeah, I think you're lying. I'm going to really examine every word you say. Is it really like that? I'm going to give you a, um, a tough time. The cross-examination is really, really harsh as, as it's meant to be. So I said, they should be like Rishaim. You should view, the guy comes with a, a the, he's wearing um, a gartol, he's learning tafyomi while he's preparing for the case. He sits and learns, you know, he goes to Minyan three times a day, eats only kosher, totally honest businessman, great reputation, big philanthropist. When he comes to court, you have to think he's evil. Uh, otherwise, what's he doing in court? If you don't have the perception that he might be lying, you're not going to get to the, the, the truth. So you balay the dim dim but when the case ends and the judgment is rendered and everybody accepted, you have to switch. It's a beautiful idea. You have to switch um, your attitude. Then they're wonderful people. Okay, the case is over. We, we had to be harsh. That's the way it goes. Now you accept it. You're a wonderful guy. I, I, you know, I have only good things to say. Um, uh, uh, but that's a very interesting thing. Not always an easy transition to make that's hard. There's an uh, there's an emotional um, you know an emotion um, you know wherewithal that a person has to have to be able to one moment view you as evil and a lawyer and the next moment give you a hug and, and a kiss for doing what you did. By the way, the the Mishnah says that when the court put to death somebody, the family couldn't sit shiva because it was put to death. They did something. You know, you know, terrible. You don't sit, sit shiva for such um, a person. And then the, um, the the relatives would go to the judges and say, "We don't hold it against you. We're not going to take revenge. You, you're doing your job." It's a it's not an easy thing, but it's also it's a beautiful idea that everybody's doing what they have to do. In truth, in the rare cases, so the family is supposed to go to the judges and say they they're they're not upset at them for um, condemning their family member. To death. That's uh, not easy. Okay, give it a name. So that's uh, we'll um, we'll stop here. Just let me do a very quick review of what we learned. So we basically discussed the relationship between um, non um, you and neighbors who may have a, um, a bad influence, and we discussed uh, the distinction between someone their character they have, and then discussed their religious attitudes. We discussed how close they are, where you have to live. 
um, living in Israel in a, in a bad neighborhood, quote unquote, versus living here in um, um, a good neighborhood. Of course, we're influenced by our surroundings, as Dr. Misha said, but we said character development is so much more important. God was willing to tolerate possible heresy. We make man because the idea of being humble and taking advice from others was more important. This idea of being humble was something that Yehuda ben Tabai is saying that uh, the judges, the Orche Hadayanim, have to know their limits because he himself made a terrible mistake. Shimon ben Shetach made a mistake, and unfortunately his son got killed, the revenge over over it. So, um, you know, this is uh, the idea of what's right and what's true, but you have to know your place. Those are really the two ideas, uh, you know, how much we can learn and uh, we discuss how much you can learn from someone who is uh, not observant or a, a heretic, maybe yes, maybe no. The two views, we only have to learn from the Kohen who is purity, the, like an angel of God, or do we accept the truth from wherever we do? And of course we do both and we have to, you know, figure out how to, how to, how to do that, but there's truth and there is, is humility and people who are humble are more likely to be honest. People who are arrogant, we know, are going to tend to lie more. So, okay, we'll uh, we'll stop here. Want to wish everybody a wonderful Shabbat. Thank you for coming. Be healthy. Be well.